There are probably quite a few of you who have fond memories of playing hill climb racing in high school. For those who don't know, hill climb racing is a game in which you control a physics-based car and you try to get as far as you can. In this video, we're going to be having a look at how you can recreate the basics of that game inside of Gidel. We'll have a look at how you can create the car, how you can set up the terrain, and how you can add things like coins and fuel. Sounds good? Now let's get started, shall we? For this tutorial, I've created an asset pack, which includes all the basic things that you need, like textures for the terrain, a car, a character, fuel and coins. I've also added some extra stuff, like a second character, a different car color and three types of wheels. You can get these assets by going to the link in the description and then on the page scroll all the way down. You can support me by paying for the assets, but you can also just grab them for free. So now let's set up the project. I have this empty project right here, and I'm going to go to Project, Project Settings, and then I'm going to scroll down to the Rendering tab. In here, I'm going to click Environment. Let's pick a color for our sky. I'm going to go with a bit of a light blue. There we go. And then let's go into display window and let's set the size of our game to 1920 by 1080. And then the test width and height, let's set that to 1280 by 720. So, and then let's go under the stretch mode and then set it to 2D. And for aspect ratio, let's keep the height. So the width can change, but the height of the game will stay the same. Now let's import the assets by right clicking here and then opening file manager. And let's just drag in the two folders. There we go. And now let's let the Kido import them. And now we have an audio folder and a folder with all the sprites. Now let's make the car. Let's add an other node. And let's search for rigid body. I'm gonna add a 2D rigid body and let's call it player. Let's immediately just add it to a group. So let's go to the node tab, the groups tab, and then let's add it to, to the player group. This will be useful later. Now let's add a sprite and this will be the car sprite. Let's go back to the inspector and in the sprites, let's drag in the car. There we go. Let's also add the collision shape. For this, we're going to be using a collision polygon 2D. And now you can draw your collision shape. I usually like to add a bit of a rounded corner so it gets stuck less often. Now let's add some wheels. Let's open up a new scene and click on other node. We're going to make another rigid body. And let's go this wheel. We also need to put this in a player group. So there we go. And then let's add a sprite. And let's go to the inspector. And what kind of wheels shall we make? Let's just go for the small one. There we go. And now on the rigid body, let's also add a collision shape. And let's make that a circle. Let's make it fit. And there we go. Now we have a wheel. Let's hit save and let's create a new folder. Call it scenes. And let's save our wheel in there. Now let's add the wheels to the car. To connect the wheels to the car, we're going to be using a pin joint. So let's add a, a pin joint to the, and let's call it wheel holder. Then we're going to be connecting node A to the player, so the car itself. And then to this, we're going to connect the wheel. So let's go into scenes and then wheel, and let's drag it under there. Let's go back to the wheel or the pin joint and let's connect node B to the wheel. 
There we go. And now we can uh, move the pin joint into place. But now it appears in front of the car, so we can move it up here, so it appears behind. Let's move it over in place. There we go. And now you can hit Ctrl D to duplicate it, and then you can move it. You can hold Shift while moving to keep the same height. And there we go. So now you have the wheels on the car. Let's save the car into the Scenes folder and save it as Player. There we go. Next, let's create a little scene to test our car on. For that, let's create a new scene and let's create a node 2D. Let's call it level one. To that, we're going to add a static body 2D. This will be the terrain for now. We'll replace it later. And to that, let's add a collision polygon 2D. For reference, let's first add the car. So let's go into the scenes folder and drag in a player. And the player is really big, as you can see. So let's zoom out quite a bit. And on the collision polygon, let's draw a little simple terrain shape. Let's go down and all the way over here, up here, here, and let's close it up. And there we go. Let's save it. Now let's save it in a new folder called Levels. There we go, and let's save it up. If we now run this, you will see that the corner is in the top there. So we'll need to add a camera. Let's immediately do that. So on the player, let's add a camera 2D. It's centered on the player right now, but we will improve the camera in a moment. We now run this. Oh, whoops. We need to go on the camera and then set current. I always forget that, whoops. <laughs> uh, as you can see, you can't see really see anything of the train. So let's close it again. Let's go into debug and then enable visible collision shapes. If we now run this, you can see the train. You will see that the car falls really slowly. Let's tweak the gravity a little bit. Now let's go back to our player scene and let's select the rigid body. Let's tweak the gravity scale. You can mess around this your, with this yourself and see what you like, but for my uh, messing around, 30 seems about right. Let's test this out. You can see it fell, falls a lot faster. Let's move our uh, player up a little. New. Yeah, seems about right. We also need to tweak this on the wheels. So let's go on the wheel, rigid body, and let's change the gravity scale to 30. And whoop, you can see it falls a lot faster and you can see the wheels are also turning, but the suspension is not really looking nice. Well, there is no suspension, so let's change that. Let's go into your player scene and select the wheel holders. You can select them by holding control. We're going to tweak the softness. Let's tw turn this up to about two and a half. And if we test this, there you go. It now bounces a little, or well, it uses the quote unquote suspension. <laughs> um, now it's finally time for some programming. So on our player, let's add a script. And uh, let's move it to a new, uh, let's just call it code. New code folder and let's save the player script in there. I like to change the template to empty uh, or no comments. Uh, let's hit create. Let's create a new variable, which we will call wheels. In here, we're going to store all the wheels. We're going to apply a force to. You can make uh, only the back tire spin, but we're going for a four wheel drive or well, in this case, a two wheel drive. Now let's grab all the wheels and put them in a wheels array. To do this, we are going to search for all the wheels within the wheel group. 
Oh, whoops, we forgot to put the wheel in the wheels group. So let's go to the wheel rigid body, the node groups, and let's add it to the wheel group. And let's save it. Now let's add some player input, shall we? In the physics process, we're going to add an if statement checking if the right arrow key is pressed. Then we need to loop over all the wheels to add a force to each single one. To add a force, we're going to be using the apply torque impulse function. Then let's add a new variable called speed. This will be how much force we will apply to the wheels. Torque needs to be a really high number, so let's go for 60,000. Then let's add it in the impulse function. Let's also multiply it by delta to account for frame drops. But since delta time is a really small number, let's multiply it by the physics frame rate, which is 60. So if we then run this and then press the right arrow key, it works, yay. At the moment though, the player can go faster and faster until the damping on the wheels stops them from going faster. So let's add a simple limit on how fast the player can go. Let's add a new variable called max speed and let's set it to 50. This value is a lot lower because it's a different type of value we're dealing with. This is angular velocity. Let's add a check per wheel if the angular velocity of that wheel exceeds the max speed. Now that we've added that, we can add the input to go backwards. Let's just do this via good old copy and paste. Let's change the input to UI left. And let's check if it doesn't exceed minus max speed. And let's apply a force of negative speed. So let's now run it. Let's see if it works. So, okay, we can move forward. And we press the other arrow key. Yay, we can move both ways. Okay, now let's just do something about this awful camera angle. <laughs> In the level scene, let's select the camera and Let's go into offset. If we tweak this, you can see we can offset the camera, but only by a little bit. To make this range bigger, we need to change the drag margin and then to the left. But we can't visualize this right now, so let's go into editor and draw drag margin. So now we can see it. If we then tweak the drag margin on the left and increase this, you can see that this range is much bigger. Let's set it to about uh, here. And then let's also tweak the zoom. Let's zoom out a little. So let's say 1.7 maybe. Makes it really big. Uh, let's Tweak the offset again a little bit. There we go. Let's test this out. Okay, that is already so much better. <laughs> now that we've finished the basic functionality of our car, it is time to add the terrain. I already have a 20 minute in-depth tutorial on how to create curved terrain in Godot, so I won't be going into much detail in this video. So just follow along with what I do and you'll be fine. <laughs> let's go to the asset library and then let's search for smart shape. And let's install smart shape 2D. There we go, let's hit install and hit install again. And there we go. If we now hit okay, a new folder should appear called add-ons with RM Smart Shape, which is Smart Shape 2D. Now we need to enable the plugin. So let's go into Project, Project Settings, and let's go to the Plugins tab. Here is Smart Shape 2D. Let's hit Enable. There we go. 
And if we now go back to our scene, we can add, we hit Ctrl A, we can scroll down and add a smart shape. But the icons don't appear because we have to restart Godot. But thanks to editing magic, I already have them. So now let's add an SS2D shape closed. Let's hit create. And then first let's just get rid of our old terrain. And then on the shape, let's first add a background texture so we can see the shape. In the images folder, there's a terrain folder with a dirt background texture. But first we need to go into the shape material. Let's open it up and in the fill textures array, we need to increase its size to one. And then let's drag in that dirt background texture. Now we can draw the shape, but the toolbar doesn't appear. So to fix that, we can deselect it and then select the node again. And the option should appear. Let's select the first tool. Let's make a massive rectangle. Whoop, whoop, and whoop. So, but as you can see, the texture only repeats once. So we need to go into the dirt texture. With that selected, let's go to the import tab. Then under flags, you have the repeat property and let's set that to enabled. Let's also immediately do that for the grass texture. Let's set it to enabled and hit re-import. If we then go back to the shape, we can select the second tool to add points along the line. You can drag it up and you can add some hills. You can right click to remove a point. So let's just create some hills. So we have some hills. We can add some curvature. With the same tool still selected, you can hold shift and then drag on a point to create curvature. There you go. And there we go. We have now a basic, we now have a basic terrain. Now let's add the grass texture on top of the dirt. To do this, let's go into uh, the edge meta materials. To avoid confusion, let's close up the fill textures. In the edge meta materials array, let's also increase it to one. Then in the first slot, we need to select an edge meta material. So we need to scroll all the way down until we see SS3 material edge metadata. Let's click that. And if we open that up, We'll see a bunch of properties like the Z index and the range on which the materials should appear. To add the textures, we need to add, add an edge material. So once again, we need to scroll down, 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 down until we see SS2D material edge. And we, when we open that up, um, we need to increase the textures array. Let's increase it to one. And now we can drag in the grass texture. Whoop. To make the grass appear, we need to move one of the points and then it shows up. So the shapes updates. Yay, now we've got some grass and it looks pretty nice. Okay, um, now we need to add a collider. To add a collider, all we need to do is hit the collider button up here with your shape selected. And now it generates a collision shape, or well, a collision polygon, as you can see, and collisions should work. So now let's just run our game, shall we? And yum. It works, yay. Okay, um, as you can see, the wheels appear behind the grass, and I kind of prefer to, them to appear um, in front of the grass. So let's move the static body up here. And well, that fixes it, yay. Okay, now let's also just go into debug and 
disable visible collision shapes again. And let's also move our car a little bit more to the start of the level. So let's select it and let's put it over here. Okay, now that we've finished the terrain, let's move on to adding coins. For the coin, let's create a new scene. Let's create a new scene up here and then let's click other node. For this, we're going to add a area. And then we're going to add an area to the node. Let's rename this to coin. And to this, let's add a sprite. Let's hit create. And then let's go into the images folder and then the pickups folder. There are a bunch of different coins. And let's drag one of the coins into the texture slot. So now we have a coin. Let's also add a collision shape to the area. Collision shape 2D, and let's change it to a circle shape 2D. Let's increase its size so it fits the coin. And now we're going to add some code to the coin. On the coin, let's add a new script and let's save it in the code folder. Use this and let's hit create. Then let's start off by adding a variable for the value of the coin. We're going to be using an export variable so you can reuse the script for coins uh, with different values. Now we need to connect a signal of when the coin is picked up. So let's click on the coin and then go to node. And in the signals, let's, uh, where is it? Body entered. Let's double click on that and let's connect it to the coin itself. We hit connect, a new function appeared. Now we'll need to check if the body that the coin is colliding with is part of the player. We'll do that by checking if the body is in the player group. Now we will need a place to store how much coins the player has collected. But first, let's save this uh, scene. And let's go, let's save the coin scene in the scenes folder. Let's hit save. And then let's go to the level. And on the root node, let's add a script. Let's call it level manager. And let's pick the code folder to save it. Okay, and then let's hit create. Now let's add a variable for how much coins the player has collected. And then let's add a function to add new coins to the total coins collected. It will take in the value of the coin and it will add it to the total coins collected. So it's more of a score. This might not be the best name, but eh, just let's just roll with it. <laughs> let's go back to our coin script and in there, Let's grab the root node of the current scene, which is the node that our level manager script is attached to. And on that node, let's call the add coins function. And we will pass in the value of the collected coin. Let's add a pickup animation for the coin. On our coin, let's add an animation player. Let's hit create. And on the animation player window, let's get animation, new, and let's call it uh, pick up. Now we're going to animate the position of the sprite and the opacity of the sprite. So let's go back to the inspector, to the transform, and let's hit the key icon right here. And let's stick use Bezier curves. When we hit create, it'll create two new tracks the X position and the Y position. We're only gonna move it upwards, so let's just delete the track for the X position. Then let's go about here and let's insert a new key. And let's make it go up. So that is minus Y. So let's say about 30 pixels up. And that is way too slow, so let's move it over. Let's also make it go a little bit higher, so minus 60 or so. 
Okay. Now let's tweak the curve a little to make it go faster in the beginning and slower uh, near the end. Let's scroll to zoom out and let's grab the Bezier handle of the first point and let's move it downwards. So it's a curve like this. Now it looks like this. Bing. Let's change the opacity of the sprite. So let's click on the sprite again. Let's go into visibility and then modulate. And let's key the modulate and also use Bezier curves. Um, we're only going to animate the alpha. So let's delete the R, G and B values. So this is a value of one and here we want it invisible. So let's add a new key. Let's click on it and let's set it to zero. And as you can see, it disappears, but it doesn't really suit the upward movement of the coin. So let's also go into uh, this curve and let's zoom in and let's tweak it so the curve looks similar to the other curve. Nice, okay, now we have that done. Let's go out of here and let's move the play hat back. And on the coin, let's add an audio stream player. Not an audio stream player 2D, because that has a position. We just want it to play uh, sort of in the center on both speakers equally. So let's use an audio stream player. And let's call it pick up. With a capital P, of course, because it <laughs> wants to be neat. Um, in the animation, let's add an audio playback track and let's select the pick up audio player. Now let's go into the audio folder and let's drag in the cone audio file. And as you can hear, it now makes a sound. Yay! Now we will need to initiate the pick up animation via code. So let's go back to uh, script on the coin. And under here, let's uh, grab the animation player and play the pickup animation. We also need to disable the collision shape while the animation is playing to prevent it from being picked up multiple times. We're going to do this by using the set the verge method on the collision shape. Set the verge basically lets you do a calculation after all the physics calculations have happened. So there won't be any physics calculations on the disabled collision shape. Let's also delete the coin after the animation is finished. To do that, let's click on the coin, go to node and in the signals. Oh no, we, we need to go to the animation player. And then in its signals, there is an animation finished signal. Let's double click it connect it to the coin, and in here we'll just simply say uh, Q3. Now it's time to test it out. Well, let's go to the level 1 scene, and in here let's add some coins. Uh, they are in the scenes folder, and let's just drag in the coin scene. Let's duplicate it a couple times, and move it over. Let's see if it works. Hopefully it does. Let's run it. And if we then drive forward, the animation and the sound plays. Nice. Okay, now let's add a UI for the coins and have a little indicator of how much coin you've collected so far. To do that, let's create a new scene and let's make the root node a canvas layer. Let's rename it to UI. And on that UI, let's add a texture rectangle. And then in your images folder and pickups, let's drag in a coin sprite. So if we zoom out, the blue line is our screen. And this is our icon. So it's, it's pretty big. But if we try to resize it, it won't work. So we have to check expand. Then you can resize it and by holding shift, you can scale it uniformly. Let's make it mm, about this. Let's put 
it over there. Now let's also add a counter. Well, first let's rename this to coin. And then for the counter, let's add a label. Let's move that over. But the font is absolutely tiny. Let's type in a zero here. It's really tiny. So let's add a custom font. I'll put a link in the description to a font called Fredoka. Fredoka. <laughs> if you scroll down, then here is a button to download the true type font file. Let's download it and let's drag it into a project. Uh, there, it, there it is. So on our label, let's scroll down to custom fonts and let's tick that. Then let's create a new dynamic font. And then in the font property, let's drag in Fredolka. <laughs> Yay, there we go. But now it's really small. So let's go into settings and let's change the size to uh, 60, 64, more, something like that. And let's add an outline. Let's increase the outline size. And then the outline color, let's change it to black. Uh, a little bigger, something like that. Nice. Oh, that turning on the filter also really helps, as you can see. Okay. Now we have that, let's hit save and let's save our scene in the scenes folder and let's just save it as UI. Now let's add the UI to our level or to our game. Let's go into the scenes folder and let's drag in the UI under the root node over our level. Then let's go into the scripts and in the level manager script, we'll need to get a reference to the label. And then we will set the text of the label to a string version of the coins collected variable. And then now let's run it. If we run into the coins, you'll see that the score will get added. We've added another feature. Nice. And let's add another one. Let's get started with the fuel mechanic. In the scenes folder, we're going to duplicate the coin scene. Let's hit duplicate and let's call it fuel. Then let's open it up and let's switch out the sprite for the fuel. Let's go into images, pickups, and then drag in the fuel. Let's also change the collision shape to a square one. Rectangle shape to the, and let's resize it to ma roughly match the size of the fuel. And let's also change the sound of the pickup. Let's delete the old sound and let's go into the audio folder and let's drag in the fuel sound effect. Let's drag it to the start. Okay, now we have that done. The animation should still work. Nice. We will need to add a script. Let's remove the old script and let's add a new one. And let's save it in the code folder as fuel.gd. Let's hit create. Oh, and it also might be a good idea to rename the root node to fuel. Let's go back to the script and let's delete the ready function. And then let's go to node and in the signals, you can also already see that it still has the old uh, coin body connected. Let's Disconnect all, let's hit OK, and let's reconnect it to the fuel. And then, let's remove those extra spaces. <laughs> let's go into the coin and let's copy this part. And then let's paste it. Let's remove this line, because this will add a coin value. Here, we will need to add a function on that we need to call on the player to tell the player that fuel has been picked up and it needs to be refueled. But we don't have fuel uh, on our player yet. So let's go into the player script and then let's add a new variable. 
called fuel. And let's set it to 100. So it starts the game with full fuel. Then let's add a function. And let's call it refuel. And in here, we're just going to say fuel is 100. So the fuel gets reset when the fuel is picked up. Now we need to call this function from the fuel pickup. In there, we will get the root node of the current scene. And we'll search for a child with the name player. And on that, we will call the refuel function. And we'll search for the root node of the level. So make sure that the player is a child of the level one node. We will all, on the fuel, we will also need to reconnect the animation player and an animation finished signal. So let's disconnect the old one and let's reconnect it to the fuel. It's connect. And then we we'll want to delete it again. Q3. Now we will need to implement the rest of the functionality in the player. So let's go to your player script and then let's create a new function. We'll use this to deplete the fuel. Let's call it use fuel and we will need a copy of delta. We will decrease the fuel by 10 times delta and you can make the number smaller or bigger depending on how fast you want to deplete the fuel. Then we will also clamp the fuel variable between 0 and 100 so it doesn't go outside of that range. Now let's make it so that the fuel depletes when the player tries to go forwards or backwards. Let's also stop the player from moving when the fuel is depleted. Select all the input functionality and then you can hit tab to indent it. Let's add a quick print statement at the bottom of our physics process to check how much fuel we have left. And now let's test this, shall we? Okay, at the bottom you'll see that it's 100%. And if we press forward, it will decrease. And if we just keep using fuel, we'll go down to 40, 30, 10. If it's hit zero, I'm pressing keys, but nothing happens. Nice. Let's also test if our fuel pickups are working. So in the level scene, let's go back into the oh, not scripts, the scenes folder, and let's drag in the fuel scene. And let's run it. We then drive into the fuel. As you can see, it goes back to 100. It's working, yeah. Now it's time to add a UI indicator for how much fuel you have left. In our UI scene, let's select the coin and let's move it down a little to make room for the fuel. Then on our root node, let's add a texture rectangle. Let's rename it to fuel. And in there, let's drag the fuel icon there we go. It's really big, so let's scale it down. Let's enable expand and let's go oops, make it about this. Yeah, that seems about right. And then uh, on our fuel sprite, let's add a progress. progress bar. Not a texture progress, but a progress bar. And let's move that over here and let's scale it up. As you can see, it shows the percentage, but let's just get rid of that. Let's go into the uh, percent dropdown and let's disable it. So in all these values, you can see it has a min and a max value, which is perfect for a fuel because it goes from zero to 100. And then the value we're going to change is literally called value. If we change this to 50, you'll see that it's halfway full filled. But there is one problem. It's ugly. <laughs> so let's fix that. Let's go into the custom styles 
and then let's enable background. And then let's add a style box flat. Let's change it to a little bit of a darker gray. And then let's go into border. And let's change the border to black. Then border width, we will want to change that to, let's see. Then for the border width, let's change that to six, 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 and six. You can see it's added a border. Then let's change the corner radius. Let's change that to 10, 10, 10, and whoops, and 10. And we added nice rounded corners, which looks pretty good. And then let's also change the expand margin because now it's the uh, foreground goes over the borders. So as you can see, if we increase this, oh, whoops, this one is over here. You can see that it increases. Um, for now, let's just set this to six, 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 and six. And you'll see why in a moment. Okay, let, now let's move on to the foreground. Let's enable it. Let's just close this one for now. And let's add a style box flat. Let's change this one into a nice green color. And then uh, let's go into corner radius and let's change that to uh, five, 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 and five for every corner. As you can see, it's also not added some pretty neat looking rounded corners. Mm. Then let's add a little highlight at the top. In border, let's change the color to a completely white color. And then in border width, on the top, let's add a little line. There we go. That looks pretty nice. So if we zoom in a little, you can still see it overlaps a little. So let's tweak the values a little bit. Let's close the foreground and let's open the background up again. And then the expand margin, let's increase it to seven, 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 and seven. Ah, that looks nicer. There we go. Now let's add some code to make it actually function. We'll need to add a new function to our level manager script. So let's do that, shall we? Let's call the function update fuel UI. And let's pass in a value to which the progress bar needs to change. Now let's get a reference to the progress bar. We'll need to open up the level one scene for the autocomplete to work. And there we go, now it works. On the progress bar, Let's change its value to the value that's passed into the function. Let's also change the color of the progress bar, depending on how much fuel you have left. To do that, let's get a reference to the green style box. Then, on the background of the style box, let's linear interpolate the hue in the color picker. If you click on the Hue Saturation Value button, you can see that the hue is about one third filled. If we slide this around, you will see that it goes from 0 to 359. But in code, these values range from 0 to 1, which is a float value. So what we need is from 0 to about one third, which is Point three. Now let's do that. We will lerp it from 0 to 0 0.3. And we will lerp it by the value, which is the fuel in the end, which is value from 1 to 100. But we'll need a decimal value, so let's divide it by 100. We will need to call this function from the player. So let's, let's go in there. Then let's scroll down to the refuel function. And let's call the function in there. We need to get a reference to the root node of the game scene. But since this is just a child of that root node, we can just say get parent. And on there, 
we can just call the update fuel UI function and we will pass in the fuel value. Then we can copy and paste it over here. So it also gets updated when the fuel gets used and when the fuel gets uh, refueled. It's also good to copy and paste it and put it in the ready function. So the progress bar shows the correct value when the game starts. Now let's see if it's working. Let's run the game. And then if we drive around, you will see that the bar depletes when we drive. Oh, whoops. <laughs> if we keep driving and driving, you'll see that it keeps depleting and will turn to a red color. And if it's fully depleted, you can't drive the car anymore. It's working. Nice. Now let's add a simple game over state, shall we? In the player scene, let's click on the player and let's add a timer node. And let's call it a uh, game over timer. And then in its properties, let's set, turn on one shot. Let's set it to about five seconds, not 55. And then let's go into the node and then signals and let's double click on timeout. Let's connect it to the player. We'll come back to this uh, in a moment. Let's scroll back up. So with this if statement, we're checking if the player has run out of fuel. And if it hasn't, then the player can still move. But if it has, let's add an else statement. And then we're going to check if the timer is not already running. And if not, we're going to start the timer. That if statement will prevent it from starting continuously. So then up here, we will add a game of timer dot stop. Every frame the player has fuel, we are going to stop the timer. And we will start the timer once the player has run out. But if the player rolls down into a fuel and has fuel again, we're going to stop the timer again. So the game over timer timeout function or signal will only be called once the player has gone for without fuel for five seconds. So this is basically our game over state. In here, for now, we're just gonna say get tree dot reload current scene. But this is the place where you can add your own logic for when the game uh, or when the player goes game over. Let's test it. So if we keep driving the car back and forth until we run out, run out of fuel, we ran out of fuel and we rolled back into a fuel pickup and we can keep going. If we then try this again, if we run out of fuel and then we have five seconds and then the game will restart. Nice, now that's working. Let's add some improvements to the car. Let's start with adding a character. In the player scene, let's first add a sprite for the little guy's body. Let's add a sprite. And let's go into images and then characters. And then you can pick the blue or the red character. Let's go for the blue one. And then let's, oh, let's switch over to the inspector. And then let's drag in the body sprite. The appears in front of the car, so let's first move it up here. And then let's move it behind the car sprite so it appears behind. Then we will need to add another rigid body. So let's add it. Rigid body. There we go. And let's rename it to head. Then to this, let's also add a sprite. And let's drag in the head sprite. And we also need to add, to add a collision shape. And let's add a circle collision shape. <laughs> About this. And then let's grab the head and let's move it over. So I kind of want to uh, have the head appear 
between the body sprite and the car sprite. So let's move it between there. And there we go. Remove this over, you can see it's in between. And then we need to add some physics joints. So let's hit Ctrl A and let's add a pin joint. This will be the head spring. If we then test this and then move around, you'll see that the head is really quite heavy and sometimes does flips like that. Let's make it a little lighter. We can, uh, on the head spring, we can loosen it a bit by increasing the softness. And on the head rigid body, we can decrease its mass. If we then run it, you'll see that it is bouncy and wobbly, but a whole lot less. If we then land on our head, you will see that it also uh, snaps, sort of, and then bounces back. But what we can also do is kill the player when it lands on its neck, just like in hill climb racing. Let's do that. Oh, oh, uh, I almost forgot. One thing is also important to set is um, if you want your player to be able to slam their head into coins and fuel to pick them up, we will also need to add the, the head rigid body to the player group. So let's go into the players, or in the, into the groups tab, and let's hit player. Yeah, okay, let's continue. <laughs> in the player script, we will need to add a new variable. Let's call it dead <laughs> for when the player breaks their neck. Let's start it all as false. And then we'll scroll down here and let's remove the old sprint statement. And then we add an if statement checking if the local rotation compared to the car of the head is more than 90 degrees or less than minus 90 degrees. We also check if the player is not already dead. And then we'll just say that dead equals true because the player snapped their neck. And also on the head spring joint, let's set node B to an empty string, basically clearing it out. This way the head can rotate freely. Then up here, we also check if the player is not dead, so they can only move when they're alive. This way, the timer also gets started. So in five seconds after the player dies, the game also gets restarted. Before we can test this though, we need to change the collision layer on the player. You can do that by going on the player and then into the collision, drop down, and then changing the bit to the second bit. And we also need to do this on the head but we're going to, we're going to change this one to the third one. This way the head and the car chassis won't collide with each other. And if you don't do this, it, it's going to be pretty glitchy. Now in the game, if you land on the character's head and it rotates more than 90 degrees, it will snap <laughs> and the game will be restarted after five seconds. Now let's add some improvements to various things in the game. The first thing we're going to add is air control, which is actually really easy to add. All we have to do is go into the input code and in there you will add an apply torque impulse function. We'll apply a force of minus 6,000 and we will multiply it by delta and we'll multiply that by 60. Then let's copy and paste this line to the other backwards input. And let's change the minus 6,000 to 2,000. And now you will be able to do front flips and back flips while holding the forward or backwards key in the air. Next up, let's add the engine sound effect. So on the player, let's add a new node and let's make it an audio stream player. Let's call it engine sound FX. And then let's go into the audio folder and let's drag in the engine sound. You can click uh, on the preview to preview it. And what we want to do is change the pitch scale when the player is driving from one to about two. 
Also, don't forget to enable autoplay. Then let's go into the code, and we will need to add a new variable to check if the player is driving or not. Let's create a variable called driving, and we'll initialize it as zero. Then in both the input if statements, let's say driving plus equals one. Let's reset the value every frame by adding driving equals zero at the top of the physics process. Then at the bottom of the physics process, let's add an if statement checking if driving equals one. So driving will be zero when no input is pressed. Driving will be one if either one of the driving keys is pressed, but driving will be two if both uh, the inputs are pressed. So only when one of the driving keys is pressed, this code will execute. Then in that if statement, let's change the pitch scale of the engine sound effect to a linear interpolation of the pitch scale to two. And we will do that by a speed of two times delta. You can change this however you want. And then if the player is not driving, we will linear interpolate it back down to one. Well, that's pretty much self-explanatory. It's working. Another bug that's currently in there is that if you hold both driving buttons at the same time, the fuel will deplete really fast. To fix that, let's remove the use fuel function from the driving input and let's move it to the is driving statement. Another good thing to know is that you can change the friction of the wheel and the bounciness. If you go on the wheel and then the physics material override, you can create a new physics material and then here you can change a bunch of properties, like the friction and the bounce. If we turn that all the way up and save it, let's run it. The car will be super bouncy. <laughs> now let's add a little alarm icon for when the player has run out of fuel. To do that, let's uh, on the fuel, let's add a new texture rectangle. Let's rename it to alarm. And in there, let's go into images, other, and then let's drag in the alarm texture. Let's move it over to here. And let's maybe turn on expand and let's scale it down a little bit. There we go. Now on the fuel, let's add an animation player. Let's hit create. And in the animation player, let's create a new animation called idle. This is for when the player has enough fuel. In there, we'll go on the alarm and then in visibility and on modulate and click use Bezier curves and hit create. Then we'll remove the R, G and B values and we only mod uh, modify the modulate alpha. Then let's go into animation, hit duplicate. Then we have a copy and then let's hit rename to alarm. And here we will go forward and then we will insert a key and we'll make it invisible. Or rather we will move this one to the end. This one is a value of one. And then you will click on this one and then hit right click here and then duplicate keys. So we have a value of zero here again. We then play. You will see that it, it uh, blinks. Let's hit this button to make it loop. And then we need to call this function or well, this animation from the code. Oh, whoops, I almost forgot something. On the idle animation, it has to be zero, not one, else we can constantly see the icon. We now move this, it's invisible. 
Okay, now let's add the code. All we have to do is go into the level manager script. And then under here in the update view UI function, let's check if the value that gets passed into the function, which is the fuel, is equal to zero. So if the player doesn't have fuel, we will play the alarm animation on the animation player. And if the player does have fuel, we will play the idle animation and hide the alarm icon. If we then test it and run out of fuel, you'll see that the alarm animation plays. If you want, you can also add an alarm sound effect. As you can see, we just picked up three coins of five, but we got 20 points. That's a bug I noticed while recording, and let's also fix that while we're at it. So that is a bug that gets introduced when uh, multiple body parts, like the head, the car is not really a body part, but also the car, uh, picks up a coin at the same time. I thought I'd fix this with the uh, disabling the collision shapes, but apparently it happens within the same physics frame. So this gets set at the end of the physics frame. To fix it, we're going to add a new variable called picked up. And then in the if statement, we'll check if it's not already picked up. And when it's picked up, we will set picked up to true, and this should fix it. So, you've reached the last chapter of this tutorial. In this last chapter, we'll add some nice parallax backgrounds to our level. So let's do that, shall we? On the level, let's add a parallax background node. And to that, let's add a parallax layer. Uh, to that, let's add a sprite. Just a regular sprite. And in the sprites, let's go into images, other, and then let's drag in the clouds texture. You can see it's right here. On the sprites, let's also go into the offset and disable centered. So the center point is on the top left. Okay, now let's tweak the parallax layer parameters. Let's go into motion. And let's set these values to 0.2 and 0.2. Then on the mirroring, let's set it to 3000 on the x-axis. So we'll mirror it, uh, that's the width of the image, and it will re repeat it after uh, 3000 pixels. We can't really see it, so let's move it a little bit up, like this. You can hold shift to move it along an axis. There we go. That looks nice. And then let's hit Ctrl D on the parallax layer. And let's go into the sprites of that one. And let's drag in uh, the background. Let's rearrange the order because uh, we want the green background to appear behind the clouds. And then on this sprite, let's move it. Oh, wrong one. This one. Let's move it down to about here. Then on the new parallax layer, it's going to motion and let's make it move a little slower. So let's set it to 0.1. There we go. And uh, I think that's about it. Let's test it, shall we? Now the green background moves the slowest and the clouds move at a medium speed. Well, that was it. You finished the entire tutorial. Good job! Well, now it's up to you to add new features and make it into an actual game. You can turn it into something similar to hill climb racing, but you can also go a completely different direction. For example, you can make it a racing game, make it split screen, or you can add guns like in the game Earn to Die. Another fun thing you can do with how we set up the car is that you can just duplicate the wheel holders and the code will just work for all the wheels. Well, that 
that was it. I really hope you learned something and I would love to do some more videos like this, recreating games inside of Godot. I was thinking of maybe doing something like recreating Angry Birds or Doodle Jump. Leave your suggestions in the comments down below of which games you would like to see recreated inside of Godot. Well, that was it for today. I am going to bed probably and <laughs> I hope to see you next time. Goodbye.